thinking about intelligence task, one element, one, one map level heading in that is causes and risk and protective factors. Then under causes, the methodology is the conjunction of criminal opportunity. Uh, quick detour on this here. Criminal event, some, somebody once unkindly called this the ek blot. Uh, <laughs> Causes coming together to make the event happen. Remote causes um, could be children's early um, life experiences. It could be, uh, you know, the state of the drugs market or something like that. It's very difficult to get a fix on remote causes because they're so diverse and at so many different levels. Much easier to think about the immediate precursors. You know, what happens, what's in that criminal event immediately before it occurs. And this is the equivalent of the crime triangle, the 11 um, generic causes, um, which after, after looking through several thousand crime prevention schemes, it sort of shook down onto, onto this list and haven't changed for about 10 years. Having said that, there's always a possibility that somebody will pop up and say, I've got one that doesn't fit there. Uh, so I had to redraw all these diagrams. Um, so on the right-hand side, it talks about the offender's criminality, <coughs> lack of skills to avoid crime, their immediate motivational and emotional state, you know, they're stressed out, they've just had a bad commute, they bump into somebody and get into a fight. Resources for, cr for crime, tools, weapons, know-how, skills. Um, then we've got the rational offender agenda of anticipation of risk, effort and reward. And it's getting further and further away from sort of permanent criminality to things which are much more attuned to situations. The offender presence in the situation about 12 o'clock. Target person or property, vulnerable, attractive, provocative. Enclosures, if the target is the crown jewels, the enclosure could be a safe, could be a locked room, could be a building or a sort of compound like a car park. Um, Tower of London. Um, wider environment, could be a train station, it could be a housing estate or a shopping centre. Two aspects to it. Uh, the motivational aspect, like it's a car park full of juicy BMWs and Mercedes, or thin walls between neighbours' apartments generating disputes over noise. Um, then you've got the tactical and the logistical side of the environment. You've got, uh, you know, pursuit, escape, surveillance, concealment. How does it solve and serve each of those? What's the balance in favour of the offender or the preventer? Preventers is a slightly wider concept, more general concept than um, uh, capable guardians, uh, handlers and place managers. I mean, it includes other roles like designers and passers-by and so on. So, but it's, it essentially means the same kind of thing. Crime promoters, it's a non-criminal role in most cases. It's people that make crime uh, more likely to happen. It could be the... Um, the naval officer that leaves his laptop in the back of his car when he goes in the betting shop. Um, or it could be um, somebody who, you know, um, your friend in the bar who says, he's just insulted you, um, hit him back. Um, or it could be a fence who says, you nick 20 of those laptops and I'll give you a good price. Uh, so different degrees of responsibility and culpability. So that's all the causes. Uh, and it, as I say, it provides a map which links offender-oriented and situational stuff in, in one framework. So just taking an environmental intervention, that's meant to be a shield, by the way, um, and uh, just taking an environmental intervention, let, let's say you've got a pattern of muggings in a hospital car park, um, and they say, right, um, it's actually easy for concealment here, let's, uh, let's trim the shrubs a bit. So that's a, an environmental design intervention. That interrupts one of the causes, which disrupts this conjunction, uh, which actually reduces the risk of criminal events, and if you're lucky, it actually gives you objective crime reduction. And then that has knock-on benefits. Uh, you know, for example, more people visit the hospital. Um, patients get better quicker, so they, they, uh, they reduce the, um, the waiting list and you know, something tendentious like that. But the important thing is to go beyond just getting crime numbers done. Think about benefits and harms. So just generalising from that, each of these intervention... Uh, sorry, each of these causal um, patterns has got 
uh, an equivalent family of interventions. So from early or remedial intervention, cognitive skills enhancements of working from the right-hand side, changing people's current life circumstances to reduce, you know, kids that are bored, restricting resources for crime, like designing photocopiers so they don't copy 500 euro notes and so on, <laughs> um, has been known. Deterrence and discouragement, excluding or deflecting offenders from crime situations. And I mean, this also applies to the criminal justice side of prevention. So topologically reversed, it's including offenders in prisons. Um, target hardening, target removal, perimeter or access security, environmental design, conflict reduction, um, surveillance and access control, uh, helping preventers, uh, perhaps through CCTV or through um, skills, knowledge and so on, discouraging and deterring careless or deliberate promoters. Anything from lock it, and lo lock it or lose it campaigns to uh, crackdowns on fences. So as I say, that, that gives you a sort of synoptic map of choices of intervention strategy in the one single framework. Another example here, um, back to the five eyes, um, involvement, um, you can break involvement down into partnership, mobilisation of people and climate setting. Um, and then you can break mobilisation down into this claimed framework. Uh, it's just a kind of a procedure to uh, help get people to do crime prevention tasks and roles. So briefly, this is Operation Moonshine. Um, I'm sorry it's not Foster's, but... Uh, um, this was um, basically, I and a colleague were invited down to uh, Hampshire and the south coast of England to look at a project on um, drink and disorder um, in a sort of fairly comfortably off housing estate in uh, just north of Southampton. Um, and uh, it supposedly worked very well. So we spent about three hours talking to it's an ordinary beat, Bobby, and um, his civilian crime prevention assistant. And um, they took us through the thing. Um, and, you know, we, this is the kind of geographical information that we got, first of all, you know, where it was, uh, social demographic patterns, um, crime data from um, police recorded crime stats plus uh, incident logs plus you know of, uh, local complaints to councillors and so on surveys of young people um, what the crime problem was which was basically kids underage drinking in a shopping centre messing the place up a um, bit of vandalism intimidating people to get them to buy drinks uh, in shops and so on um, it slightly um, drew in uh, some drug dealers because, you know, here's a mass of disorderly people, so the drug dealers came from Southampton. This really rather spoilt the um, custom of the shops and it messed up the lives of people who had to kind of run the gauntlet of these, young, these youngsters <coughs> loaf, loafing around uh, in, in large numbers. Uh, so, um, anyway, we then start thinking about the causes of the problem and under these sort of conjunction of criminal opportunity headings and I won't go through them all but uh, I mean, basically uh, the shopping centre was a great big crime attractor because there were all these places where they could get drinks, place to hang around. There were loads of kids in the area, they were ready to offend because they were bored out of hell. Their parents would just sort of give them some money and say hey don't bother us. So the, the, um, the parents were acting in some ways as crime promoters uh, when they should have been acting as crime preventers, inadequate staffing of local shops, uh, and as I said, this drug market was establishing itself. And as I said, we had this three-hour chat with these two in the in the uh, in the local team, and at the end of three hours, we got a lot of information, including the fact that they'd come up with 13 separate interventions. I mean, we were gobsmacked with how much they'd actually done in a completely um, untutored way. Um, they developed all these more to the point they were you know did we do that my god they they'd never reflected on it they'd never actually had to sort of restate it in a sort of semi-formal way to anybody and of course they didn't know what they'd done nobody else did so there's no kind of sharing of this information beyond a sort of vague rumor that they'd done something good